No. Since we've been talking now, going back to the ancient period of 2005, 2006, at that time, GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, was, was the only one out there saying, you know, gold's being manipulated, the price of silver's being manipulated, and they, got, they were vilified, you know, across the spectrum, people saying, you guys are paranoid conspiracy theorists. Since that time, we've had the LIBOR, massive interest rate rigging, multi-hundred trillion dollar scandal. We've got massive rigging in the energy markets now, exposed here in London. We've got massive fraud from the biggest banks, HSBC, Barclays, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. There's an investigation in HSBC for silver rigging. Uh, it, it seems that if it, if it quacks like a duck, maybe it's a duck. I mean, th th the price of gold and silver is, uh, has got to right, James Turk. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, they've been right for 10 years. And in order to understand the movements in the market, you have to know what Gata knows. Um, you have to understand, you know, how the markets are being manipulated. Um, you know, it used to be that governments followed, uh, manipulated their currencies in order to match the purchasing power of gold. Now they're manipulating gold to try to match the ever diminishing purchasing power of their currencies. You know, that's the basic principle. Uh, because if you control money, you can control an economy. And if you control an economy, you can control its people. It used to be that governments followed, uh, manipulated their currencies in order to match the purchasing power of gold. Now they're manipulating gold to try to match the ever diminishing purchasing power of their currencies. You know, that's the basic principle. Uh, because if you can control money, you can control an economy. And if you control an economy, you can control its people. And that's what governments want to do these days. When did that flip take place? Uh, it was really, you know, over the whole 20th century. You know, 20th century is one of the increasing government control. But certainly in 1971, when the U.S. closed the gold standard, the gold yeah. window, that financialized yeah. the global economy, and what you just talked about kicked in. Yeah, that was one of the last nails in the coffin. You know, historically, there's a link between human liberty and gold. This is what gets the gold bug so religious, because what gold does is it imposes discipline on government spending. It, it, government cannot create gold out of thin air, but it can create paper money out of thin air to increase its power, and that's exactly what's been happening over the past several decades, and it's led to all of the financial imbalances and problems that we have today. I'm curious about Germany because there's been some concern about uh, the German central bank's gold holdings. And actually, an executive board member of the Bundesbank did recently address these concerns in a speech and said that these are unfounded, irrational fears, that the gold is safe, that the Bundesbank has always had a great relationship with the Federal Reserve. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about this debate on Germany's gold. And I do want to point out that at least this executive committee member did acknowledge the importance of gold. Yeah, the issue is, is where is the Bundesbank's gold? Um, you know, uh, a lot of it had been stored outside of, of Germany. But you have to look at it from a um, geopolitical point of view. Uh, Owning, uh, ownership of gold is one of the pillars under, underneath a country's sovereignty. Uh, where does the U.S. store its gold? It stores its gold in the United States. Why should Germany s store its gold outside of Germany? It should store it within Germany, in my view. You know, gold is um, dispersed in a variety of different central bank vaults around the world by many countries because of the remnants of the old gold standard, where gold was moved from one part of a, a vault to another part of the vault to settle international transactions. But we stopped that system 40 years ago. You know, gold is now used as a reserve uh, in case you need it for a rainy day or to rebuild the currency. And with all of the problems in Europe today with the euro and the fact that the European Central Bank is not following Bundesbank monetary discipline, I think it would probably make sense for Germany to return its gold and keep it in Frankfurt under the, uh, in the vaults underneath the Bundesbank, just in case. That's very interesting. Is there uh, an accurate or public accounting of gold for central banks? Like the Bundesbank, do we really know if it's all accounted for? No, no, not, not really, because if you look at a central bank's balance sheet, they book a, a one line item. They call it gold and gold receivables. In other words, they're mixing gold in the vault with gold out in loan as the same line item, which doesn't uh, conform with generally accepted accounting principles, but the IMF allows the central banks to do that. In fact, um, if you look at the Bundesbank Act in relation to German, uh, Germany's gold, Section 26 says that they have to prepare their annual accounts according to generally accepted accounting principles. But nevertheless, 
they book uh, gold and gold receivables as one line item, which doesn't conform with generally accepted accounting principles. And uh, I've underst uh, understood from uh, people who've asked the Bundesbank about this, it's because they, uh, the IMF uh, asks them to report that way rather than uh, conforming with the letter of the law of the Bundesbank Act itself. I was laughing today. Uh, I saw a French commentator on CNBC Europe real early in the, this morning, and the guy was talking about the Bernanke comments and the Fed comments and what they had to say uh, uh, recently about what the Fed was going to do. And, it, and the guy was so blunt. He said, it was a joke. He says, they're talking about a strong dollar. And they said, well, what do you mean a strong dollar? Timothy Geithner, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, recently was talking about I mean, I mean, it's like talking about feeble words, and when they can talk so blatantly like that in Europe, that you know, the Bernanke, our U.S. comments, it's really a joke. We're doing nothing about our problems. They're getting worse and worse and worse. I think it was the other day they were making a big deal out of a $35 billion deficit and a, a new budget, whatever they were doing, and in, in the four days during which they were talking about it, it went up another $38 billion. Yeah. It's just out of control, and we're not dealing with it in the U.S. Yeah, that's key. It is out of control. I think that's one of the reasons why I've been talking about a waterfall decline in the dollar. Uh, I've been doing this on King World News as well as other places. And uh, the other day I did a blog with uh, Eric King saying that, you know, the waterfall decline begins now. I was using the Bernanke press conference as the, as the turning point and saying that years from now we'll look back to 2011 and say this is the year that the, the waterfall decline in the dollar began. And before the uh, coming down here this morning and, and, and uh, doing this uh, uh, discussion, I checked uh, prices and the dollar index is under 73, uh, closing in on its all-time low in the 71 area. Do you expect that low to be taken out soon? I would think so. Uh, I think that's what the markets are telling us. Um, and I think it's going to be you know, quite extraordinary because you know, when, when those events happen, they can feed on themselves. and. It, it, it can get uh, quite dramatic, and I, I don't think the, I know in America, uh, people don't realize the ramifications in terms of inflation and, and standard of living, and, uh, but it's clear. I mean, the United, the United States, it doesn't, our inflation levels are picking up everywhere you, you look, and yet they're making sure that interest rates stay exactly where they are, right above zero, and long-term rates, the uh, Treasury rates uh, may, uh, stay below the ten, yield on the 10-year note below 3.5%. And it's so it's just artif it's officially creating all this situation where money's going to go into real things and especially gold and silver. Yeah, that's why I use the term waterfall decline because it's something that can really gather momentum when, when confidence breaks. And I think that's what's happening. You also raise a good point about, you know, people are sort of asleep at the switch within the U.S. You know, when a currency collapses, it comes, uh, the recognition that a currency is about to collapse comes first from outside of the country. You know, people who are holding dollars outside of the country recognize it first and they start getting rid of their dollars so you see the dollar decline on foreign exchange markets. But within the country, you know, because people are getting their salaries and being paid in dollars and they're using dollars at the grocery store or the, at the gas station, you know, they're a little bit uh, slower to uh, understand what's actually happening to the currency. But, you know, given what's going on in gold and given what's going on in silver, it suggests to me that we really are sort of near collapse of the currency and that gold and, and, and silver could rocket higher. Um, are you planning to put the Gata rockets on your website anytime soon? <laughs> Every time I put up the Gata rockets, Gata rockets and the Gata sign, I, I get grieved because it's usually a top when I get that excited. So I've, I've been banned from putting them up until, but I might just have to do something. At least then I can alert maybe our people that maybe they should take some profits. I mean, given that silver's up 150% over the past year, what, as, a, as a commodity trader, what, what, what would you normally think? This is obviously, you know, a very rare event. To it's see a rare some, event. Yeah. And I think, well, I just wrote the other day that it may be unprecedented in market history because, as I mentioned, the silver market is extremely overbought technically and still extremely oversold fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Some of the shorts don't have, the, they, they, they've been found out. They mm -hmm. don't have the physical silver and the big money, the smart money, knows it and they're going after them. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, I think it's gonna, it could be something that no one's ever seen before, and it's, it's going to be spectacular. 
Uh, yes, we're at lofty levels and we're close to that magic 50 number. And um, there's only been still, there's only been two higher silver fixes, two, no, two or three uh, in history that back when, when silver made the move in 1980 under the Hans. Once you take that number out, uh, who's this, and if the dollar's collapsing at the same time and the shorts don't have the silver, what are they going to do? And of course, from, God has exposed this thing. And you know, people say, well, there's going to be a default, a force majeure, and the, the, the exchange is going to let, let uh, the big shorts out. Well, well wait a second here. The, CFT, the CFTC has been told by these major shorts that they're hedged. Now, what do you mean? Well, if you're hedged, deliver yeah. for their, because of their, the size of their massive short positions. Then there's been a CFTC investigation for two and a half years. Well, all of a sudden you have, this is what the Gotta Camp and people like Ted Butler have been screaming about and saying, foul, foul, foul. How can you then have that happen if you did nothing? And then there's the 25 lawsuits against some of the major shorts. It's going to be a stink beyond belief. And maybe that'll bring, uh, get God some attention to focus on some of the, give us the attention so we can focus on these issues and how this could have happened because there's some people that should pay for this big time. Will it be a government bailout of the shorts? Uh, you know, it's interesting because in some markets, remember, you could get bailed out. But what, what's the, where the, gov the government doesn't have the silver either. No, they don't have the silver, but they have the printing press. They have the printing press. And what, so, what, you what know, price? if you short silver and you have a printing press and you can deliver, you know, create as many dollars as you want, do you really care if you're short? Well, the question is, at what price? I mean, at 50 is one thing. At 100, 150, they, we're, we're going to throw it. They say there's some serious money is going to start mounting on the short. Now, but the dollar, by the same token, is going to continue declining. Well, well here, and, and, and if, in fact, because if, this is where Gata would come from, if you put that money uh, along with the, the paying interest on their treasury notes and so on and the value of real, of, of real estate by keeping, doing what they can uh, by keeping interest rates low at the stock markets, uh, the dollar or doing whatever they can, the money he lost in silver, no matter what it is, is still to trifle. But it's still going to be some pretty big money. Hey guys, SGT here, and I couldn't be more enthusiastic about having on the phone right now one of my favorite people on the planet, James Turk, the founder of Gold Money. Gold Money is a place where folks can buy physical precious metals and have them securely stored in the vaults of gold money in different vault locations around the planet. James Turk is also the co-author of the book, The Coming Collapse of the Dollar. Mr. Turk, such a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Sean. It's a pleasure to be with you. We are seeing so much volatility in the gold and silver space, but for those of us that have been trying to um, accumulate these metals for any period of time, we're kind of getting used to this. I know that you've noted that this summer you're expecting a nice run-up in gold. So where do you think we're headed? Well, you know, let's step back and take a look at the, at the long-term uh, point of view. Um, I'm sticking with my long-term forecast that sometime between 2013 and 2015, gold will be about $8,000 an ounce and silver will be about $400 an ounce. And the ratio between the two metals will be 20 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. And I made this forecast back in October 2003, uh, obviously when the price of both gold and silver was much, much lower. But the point I'm making is that we're in a financial bust. And during a, a financial bust like the one we've been in for several years, and we still have a few more years to go, people move out of financial assets and they move into tangible, ass tangible assets because they're looking for a safe haven. Uh, they want to avoid counterparty risk. And the safest of all havens are the precious metals because they're a tangible asset with no counterparty risk. So, you know, from a long-term point of view, I think we're still heading, you know, much, much higher. And you mentioned, you know, the way I approach the markets, which is to continue accumulating. You know, don't view gold to be an investment. It really isn't an investment because it doesn't generate cash flow. It's really money. And when you accumulate gold this way, you're actually saving money. And saving money is a good thing. At some point in time in the future, we're going to take these savings and either uh, invest them or we're going to spend them or, you know, just continue to hold them. But at some point in time in the future, uh, gold's value will be at a maximum and uh, you'll want to uh, take advantage of everything that you're saving, saving now through, the, through the, uh, these relatively difficult economic and financial times. With regard to the short term, uh, yeah, I, I am looking for a pop. Uh, up in the gold price this summer, and it relates back to what happened in December. Uh, excuse me, in the summer of 1982, 
when the Mexican government defaulted on its debt and it sent gold up 50% in three months and a double in uh, uh, six months, a, a double in the gold price. The circumstances today are very similar. The, go- the, the government ready to default, uh, to default, though, is not Mexico. It's Greece, uh, Portugal, Ireland, uh, maybe even Italy, who knows. But, you know, there are any number of countries that could be defaulting under debt. And when that happens, I think that could really light a fire under the gold price. So that's why I was making some comments about uh, be prepared for an upside jump in the gold price this summer. Absolutely. When you made that forecast of $8,000 gold between 2013 and 2015 and 2003, gold was trading around $350 an ounce, and silver uh, at that time was probably around 4 or $5 an ounce. You've been right a very, very long time, and it's your track record. And frankly, it's the way you speak with such uh, sincerity and grace that I think makes people, the common man, the, the folks that, uh, that I kind of represent, your message really resonates with us because we, we view you as a very trustworthy person and a trustworthy the source of information. Now, let me ask you this. What do you see as being... Before you go on, let me just say, before you go on, let me just say thank you for those comments. I sincerely appreciate it. Let me just add one thing because, you know, gold was $350 in uh, October, in uh, 19, uh, excuse me, 2003, you know, when I made those forecasts. But I want to explain that there's no myth or magic to these forecasts. It's really mathematics. And to explain this point, $350 $350 in October 2003, uh, when I was interviewed in Barron's where I made that forecast, was approximately equal to $35 in 1971, allowing for inflation over the intervening 32 years right. of, uh, of time. Right. So if gold can go from $35 to $800 in the 1970s, which it did, I was basically saying that history can peak will repeat on an inflation-adjusted basis, taking gold from 350 to $8,000. So, you know, gold really is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Um, And, you know, that's the way I think people really should look at it. You know, it's a form of liquidity. Uh, It's a way to protect your purchasing power. At some times you want to own a lot of it. At other times you want to own less of it. But, you know, gold is still undervalued and you want to continue accumulating it and ignore the volatility that we're seeing in these markets. You know, on the day of the month that you're supposed to be buying and saving money, you know, go ahead and do it and wait until next month. Over time, a dollar-cost average approach like this is going to work very well for you. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you a follow-up question then on that, because I think when we talk about uh, $400 an ounce silver and $8,000 gold, you're probably using the same uh, statistics uh, of accounting that John Williams would use. And so my follow-up question is, beyond that, do you consider the massive amount of paper, silver, and gold in the marketplace when you calculate how much even higher than that the prices of these metals could possibly go when the paper fraud unwinds? Yeah, you know, I do in the back of my mind. The, the problem with the paper part of the market is that we really just cannot um, determine accurately how much paper is out there. And, you know, there have been estimates. I've always thought it was about 20 times more paper than, than actual physical metal. But, you know, at the CFTC hearings uh, over a year ago, you know, it came out that there's 100 times more paper than there was actual metal. That's right. But, you know, here's the point, John. Even if there's two times more paper than there is metal, somebody's going to be disappointed at the end of the day if they're holding paper instead of the real thing. Absolutely. Because during the financial crisis, you know, there are defaults, you know, and uh, people uh, break promises. Governments break promises. Uh, Banks break promises. And it's this kind of promise breaking that occurs during a financial bust uh, that makes gold and silver so attractive. Physical gold and silver, though, not their paper representatives or paper substitutes. Absolutely. And I just want to weigh in here for the audience that when when we talk about sound money and when you say that gold and silver in the physical form have no counterparty risk, that does mean that there are no promises on that on that metal. When you own it, you own it and nobody else can uh, can leverage that away from you or steal it through a you know a broken paper promise. You know, I get a lot of PMs, uh, James, from folks saying, you know, where do I keep it? Do I do I really just buy a safe and, and bolt it to my basement or you know, what do you recommend here? And I think at the end of the day, um, certainly I recommend that, you know, uh, to some degree uh, for somebody who would like to have some on hand for a worst case scenario. But gold money is really an excellent way to go because it's in your secure vaults. It's audited. It's really there. And um, I I think people need to know about gold money. Should we just talk briefly about that before we move on to my other questions? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background, though, because, you know, you, hit, you again, you hit the nail on the head in terms of dealing with physical metal. You know, when you're buying physical gold or buying physical silver, there are really only two ways to do it. You buy it and you store it yourself, or you buy it and you have someone store it for you, which is what we do in Gold Money. Now, each alternative has different advantages and disadvantages. So, for example, if you buy it and store it yourself, you, you have it at hand, but the disadvantages are that you, uh, you know, uh, may not be able to get insurance for it. You know, there's the risk of theft. Um, and there's also the illiquidity. You know, if you need that gold or you need that silver, you end up having to take it down to the shop uh, and, you know, pay various fees, et cetera, uh, to convert it back into a national currency. In gold money, the disadvantage is that you don't have it in hand but the advantages are that you have instantaneous liquidity in that you can sell it and get the spot price of the, the, uh, the metal in any of six uh, major currencies and have that wired to your bank account uh, anywhere in the world. Um, now, the, the key risk that people are taking when they have uh, gold stored for them by others is you really want to know that the gold and silver are really there. And so what we do in gold money is we have regular audits uh, by two different firms, uh, you know, confirming, among other things, that the weight of gold and silver in the vaults is exactly equal to the quantity of uh, gold and silver owned by our customers. And these audits are available to our customers. We've been doing this now for 10 years, and we're storing over $2 billion of uh, customer assets. The other advantage of gold money is that you can store your gold in vaults that are located in London, Zurich, or Hong Kong, so you've got good political, geographic, uh, political and geographic diversification, which again is a way of mitigating your risks when owning physical precious metals, you know, the risk of confiscation by any one government. Hey, I wanted to ask you this. Um, which part of the world do you see at greatest risk right now for default? The European Union, the United States, or Japan? Uh, you left out the UK. <laughs> or the UK. Uh, they're, right up there with the, <laughs> they're right up there with the others. You know, it's uh, which horse in the glue factory is the best looking, you know? They're, they're all pretty bad. Um, and it's really hard to predict which one's going to go first. But, you know, clearly Greece is the, uh, the, the sovereign risk uh, uh, at the moment that's perhaps the one that is um, worthy of getting the most attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their financial condition is just terrific. Uh, the government is trying to shove down the throats of the Greek population, uh, measures that are unbelievably unpopular. Uh, you know, the government has just really screwed it up. The banks that continued lending to Greeks uh, really screwed it up as well. Uh, so that's where we should really be focusing our attention. And the European Union has just been making, you know, one bad decision after another mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, trying to, you know, uh, bail out these, these various debtors. And it's, it's similar to the United States in the sense that, you know, why should taxpayers in, um, let's say, West Virginia bail out uh, California if California defaults on its debt? Right. Uh, you know, will people in Germany uh, bail out Greece if Greece defaults on its debt? Um, you know, there's no logical reason why that happens. Um, the only reason why these bailouts are occurring is because the banks have control of the politicians, and the banks don't want to take the loss, so they're putting the losses on the shoulders of the taxpayer. But that's killing the economy, uh, and the taxpayers have had enough. You know, in Spain, for example, the unemployment rate, the official unemployment rate is 21%. Mm -hmm. The unofficial unemployment rate is over 30%. And the youth unemployment rate officially is 40%. Uh, it, I mean, we have depression conditions in a lot of places in Europe. You know, Greece is as bad as, as Spain in terms of its economic conditions. And the politicians refuse to accept reality, although it's changing. There was a big election in Greece this past week, excuse me, in Spain this past weekend, where the ruling party at the local level uh, had a huge loss. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some changes coming at the political level. The same thing has happened in Germany. But uh, I don't know what it's going to take to shake up these politicians, that the, but this road that they're on is clearly the wrong road. And, um, uh, you know, I think the demonstrations and uh, political results that we're seeing in Europe uh, and in other places as well to a certain extent uh, are a reflection of the discontent that's growing worldwide with the present system as it's structured. Well, absolutely. And, and the reason I wanted to throw the United States in the mix is, uh, I mean, I understand what's going on in Greece, as do many of our listeners, but on a 
economic level, aren't the problems in Illinois and California and many other states uh, in the United States, which are in dire straits, even in worse shape? And now that the federal, now that the debt ceiling has been reached on a federal level, what do we make of this? I mean, I think most Americans are in a hypnotic state, and they're just not recognizing how bad things are in this country. So when we when we hear that Greece is ready to default, isn't that many times a smaller economy than California? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not so sure that Americans are in a hypnotic state. I think the politicians are in a hypnotic state uh, because they're refusing to recognize recognize the reality that the you know they're running out of money you know one of my favorite quotes from margaret thatcher is, is she said the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money you know one of my favorite quotes from margaret thatcher is, is she said the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money and that's exactly what we're seeing now so, you know, these socialist policies that governments throughout the world have been following, uh, they, they have to go in a different tact. They, you know, they have to go back to, you know, 19th century and uh, 18th century America, uh, you know, which, you know, created all of the wealth uh, in, in, in America. It was basically limited government, let people get on with their lives, you know, very, very low, if any, tax burden, so that the productive sectors of the economy uh, can 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 produce and the middle class can save and 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 work uh, and produce and, and enjoy the fruits of their efforts, not have it taxed away by some government. You know, the backbone of capitalism is really the middle class, and it's the middle class that's been getting screwed by governments around the world uh, by these huge bailouts and the tax burdens that are being placed on the backs of the middle class. Well, and these central banks, sir, I mean, people are finally waking up to the fact that, you know, this system is a beastly system. This is not a system that supports the common man. This is not a system that's honorable. This is not a system that's built on liberty and justice any longer, especially in this country, this country that I love. We really care about this country, and we're trying to sound the alarm to wake up our, you know, brothers and sisters and say, look, um, this isn't going to get better. This is going to get worse before it gets better. So I guess my question for you, um, James, is, when the government, which is supposed to re represent us, is so off the tracks in terms of common sense on both the federal and in many cases the state level, and I'll cite the recent Indiana State Supreme Court ruling, which nullified the Fourth Amendment in that state as one good example, how do you explain the populace still being so indifferent and pacified and clueless when it comes to these critical life-changing issues we've been discussing? You know, that's a really good question. You know, I I'm not really a social scientist. I'm, I'm not a politician. Uh, I am an observer, and what I've observed is the fact that 58% of the American, pol uh, American public gets a check from the government in some extent. You know, 44, 43 million Americans are uh, getting food steps from the government. So I think there, to a large extent there's uh, a, a tremendous effort to not to shake the boat in the hope that maybe they'll continue to get these government benefits in the future. But it ignores the reality that the federal government is, for all practical purposes, broke. Uh, and, you know, whether it happens next month, next year, or in five years, that reality of not having any money uh, is going to come home. And there are only two things that can happen. The U.S. government defaults on its debt uh, by not repaying it, or they default on its debt by destroying the currency. And the history of uh, money has always been that when the government has the power to create money out of thin air, which the U.S. government has had the power since creating unconstitutional money in 1971 by going off the gold standard, it can create money out of thin air and therefore destroy the dollar. And that's essentially what uh, Mr. Bernanke is doing at the Federal Reserve. That's why inflation is starting to get to, to get worse. You know, he calls it quantitative easing, which is a fancy name, but really it's just money printing. And printing too much money is ultimately, which is ultimately the, destruct, the, the destroyer of currencies. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up, because that was one of my next questions, quantitative easing. Jim Rickards is saying that there will not be a QE3. He's saying that there's enough Fed assets on the balance sheet to sort of continue to grease the wheel and take care of the bond market in the meantime. But isn't that all smoke and mirrors? Is there, is there really any way that the Federal Reserve could get away with not doing QE3? Won't the system collapse without a QE3? Yeah, that's the way I see it. I mean, when they started QE2 in August uh, to, the, uh, to the present, the U.S. government's debt has risen about $750 billion. Approximately $500 billion of that was purchased by the Federal Reserve. Now, the U.S. government's planning to spend even more money 
in the future. And the only way that they can get that money is either people lend it to them or they run the printing press. Now, we've already seen with QE2 that of that $750 billion, there's $500 billion that is coming from the printing press rather than from people who are willing to lend to the federal government. And given the unwillingness of the federal government to cut spending in the future, one can only assume that the Federal Reserve is going to continue their program of quantitative easing until the dollar is ultimately destroyed. But here's the important point, Sean. Nobody really knows the future, and that's where gold and silver come in. You know, they're a form of protection until the, until the future becomes uh, clear, until a lot of the uncertainty is gone, uh, until we get back on a sound monetary uh, road. Uh, you can hold that gold and silver as a form of protection. Um, and it's, it's a way of dealing with an uncertain financial climate and an uncertain future. Let me ask you about hyperinflation. Uh, which you've said is now a sure thing. In fact, I think you've said the chances are now 100% that we will see hyperinflation in the United States. How do we help people understand how important it is to get your arms around what that means? Yeah, first of all, let's explain why hyperinflation occurs. And I've already started the explanation by talking about quantitative easing. You know, when a government is spending more money than people are willing to lend to it, when you know, uh, when the government is borrowing. The, the government has to either cut back on its spending or turn to the central bank to get that money created out of thin air, which the government gets and then the government then spends. And that's what's happening in the U.S. now. So we're on this road to what I call hyperinflation or this road to what history has shown is what I call the fiat currency graveyard. And if we don't get off this road, the dollar is going to end up in that graveyard uh, by hyperinflation. Um, and what we have to do is to go back to our constitutional principles. You know, that's why Article 1, Section 8 and 10 talk about gold and silver being the currency of the United States. You know, the first currency of, of, of America was the continental. That was the war during uh, the currency during the War of Independence and the years after. And it was issued to, to excess. Too much of it was issued in the continental collapse. So one of the reasons why the framers created a more perfect union was to create a common market and a common currency, which was the silver dollar. And so it was, you know, for basically up until 1971. Now, we abandoned the wisdom of the framers by going off the gold standard. And as a consequence of abandoning the wisdom of the framers, we're relearning the same lessons they learned with the continental, which collapsed. And so my concerns are the dollar is going to collapse just like the continental if we continue doing the same thing that the framers of the Constitution did after the War of Independence. So, um, uh, you know, that's the situation we're in. And with the debt limit now, it looks like they're just kick kicking the can down the road. You know, they want to increase the debt $2 trillion to take it from August 2nd until the November 2012 election. Two, that's $2 trillion in 15 months that's going to be spent. Um, and basically, they're saying they don't have the political will to solve the problem now. And if they don't have the political will to solve the problem now, who's to say they're going to have the political will to solve the problem in November 2012? I don't think they will. So, you know, kicking the can down the road is not the answer. You know, we need answers now. And the only logical answer is to read the Constitution, go back to the monetary system created by the framers, which is based on gold and silver. And a lot of these problems and excesses are going to solve themselves if we get off the backs of, of people and allow the free market you know, to cleanse the system that's, that's been created. It's going to be tough, but the longer you push the problem down the road, the bigger it's going to become. And for those of us in a helicopter that can see this road and have the 30,000-foot view about these issues, sir, we can see where that road ends. And you can, they can kick the can down the road, but unfortunately the end of the road is a cliff, and they're running out of road. One other thing about yeah, one other thing about the end of the road, uh, you know, there are two things that happen uh, after a currency collapse, and you can look at this, you know, based on experiences around the world. After the currency collapse with the Continental, we went the right way. We we went back to the rule of law. We understood what the problem was. We created gold and silver as the basis of a new currency system. But in Germany, after the collapse of the Reichsmark in the 1920s, they went the bad way. You know, they went to more authoritarian control, more fascism, and look where that, that happened. And monetary experience shows that, you know, you don't always go the right way. Sometimes you go the bad way, and that should be worrying as well. 
It should. For those of us who are informed, though, you know, we're going to look to men like Ron Paul and Rand Paul, and, and hopefully the, the Americans that I accuse of being in a hypnotic state will wake up at that point. Uh, and it, may, it might take a currency collapse for those folks to wake up. So, Mr. Turk, for folks who are saying, well, you know, the Fed can put an end to this thing quick and save the dollar by raising interest rates, and, and they have a plan, in my microdoc, The Madness of a Law Society 2, you noted, and I quote from that microdoc, as interest rates rise, the interest expense goes up, causing a bigger deficit, causing the government to borrow more, causing the Federal Reserve to do additional quantitative easing, further debasing the dollar, and ultimately meaning higher gold and silver prices. So they're really trapped here at these, these low 0% interest rates, aren't they? Yeah, they really are. They have to do what we did, what the Congress did after the um, uh, the Civil War. You have to create a 10-year plan to go back to sound money. It's not going to happen overnight, but you need a plan and you need to start right away. But let me end on an optimistic note, Sean, because what we're seeing happening at the state level is, I think, what's necessary. You know, the states have to go back to the federal system that was created by the framers and one of the important things that we're seeing at the state level is the concern about the problems with the Federal Reserve note, you know, the, the dollar as it presently stands, and the desire to create an alternative currency which can be used within states uh, should, the, um, uh, should the U.S. dollar collapse. So Utah has recently passed some legislation. We've seen that legislation now uh, being uh, reviewed in South Carolina. Uh, years ago, uh, I was involved with the initial effort in New Hampshire, uh, you know, for sound money legislation. We've seen it in uh, Nevada, I think Indiana, Montana, uh, and a few other uh, places as well, maybe even Minnesota. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's on the list. But it, what we have to do is at the state level recognize the importance of being able to use gold and silver once again as a form of money and currency. And the fact that so many states are doing that, I, I'm very encouraged by that, that, by that result. Absolutely. We're all excited to see that legislation passed in Utah. Hey, before I let you go, I want to ask your advice. What advice would you give to those of us who are sounding the alarm but finding many deaf ears among both friends and family when it comes to these important issues? Yeah, the only thing you can really do is make sure that you and, and your immediate family who share your concerns are protected. And the best way to do that, obviously, is to have tangible assets, have gold and silver, and provide everybody else with you know, uh, educational material and let them make the decision for themselves as to whether they share your concern or not. Um, but, you know, just like, you know, people in Katrina uh, in Louisiana, some were prepared for Katrina and some were not. The ones who relied on the government, you know, ultimately ended up suffering very, very badly. The ones who were prepared for Katrina, they did okay. I mean, it was a tough time, but they were able to get through. You know, we've got a financial Katrina coming, and we have to be prepared for it. Um, and if you are prepared for it, it's going to be tough, but you're going to be able to get through the other side. Well, thank you for your time, sir. And I want to just ask you in parting, uh, to get involved in gold money for folks who are listening that might want to start to buy some silver and have it stored in your uh, secure vaults, how does that work, and what is the minimum required investment to get started? Yeah, there is no minimum. There is no maximum. You can go to goldmoney.com open up a holding for free and just see how it looks and how it works and then make a decision as to whether you might want to try it. Choose which vault you want to store your precious metals that you purchase. And if you feel comfortable with it and like it, then just use it as one of your vehicles for accumulating, saving precious metals. Well, Mr. Turk, James Turk of Gold Money, we thank you so much for your time. And guys, I'm going to put a link to Mr. Turk's YouTube channel, which is Gold Money News. Absolutely check it out and subscribe. Uh, he just put up some more videos. Uh, I think there's an interview here with Bill Murphy. Just some fantastic information on Gold Money News on YouTube. And James Turk, thanks so much for your time. We couldn't be more appreciative. Thanks, Sean. Let's do it again at some time in the future. Thank you. I look forward to it, sir. Okay. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that's it, guys. Thanks again for tuning in. And be sure to check out sgtreport.com, where we cover a lot of ground on a daily basis. Until next time. Thanks for watching.
right, so is the democratic process tearing down the house of cards Eurozone policymakers have built to solve the debt crisis? Let's take stock of what's been going on politically in Europe. You can decide for yourself. Nicolas Sarkozy, the French president, Merkozy's second half, did not win the first round of French elections. He came in second place. Now he and his first place opponent are reportedly vying for the votes of the far right National Front Party. Now they fielded first place candidate or third place, excuse me, I should have said, Marine Le Pen. Now, what's interesting is that as Europe integrates further, internally, certain countries have seen the rise in fringe political parties, nationalist or right-wing movements. Now, France is an example. Marine Le Pen, though she was defeated, got close to 18% of the vote. Her party seeing unprecedented gains. Now, she reportedly campaigned on anti-immigration and economically on protectionism and on exiting the euro. The Dutch Freedom Party, that's another example. The Dutch government collapsed and the prime minister resigned Monday after the far-right party withdrew its support for the government and withdrew from talks about austerity. Now, this is interesting because the northern countries, the richer countries, surplus countries, have seen themselves as the good guys doing the right thing financially, economically. So what happens if one of these countries rocks the Eurozone boat or jumps ship entirely? And what does all of this mean for precious metals? Well, we spoke to James Turk about it. He's founder of Gold Money and the author of The Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It, Make a Fortune by Investing in Gold and Other Hard Assets. Uh, here's our conversation. We've seen a lot of coverage of protests in the periphery in Greece and Spain and Portugal. We haven't seen that kind of discontent in these richer countries. I'm just asking you, I know you're not a political expert, but you are in Europe. Is there any kind of sense that there could be such discontent in these richer countries that we could see one of them pull out of the Eurozone or, or the Euro? Yeah, it really is interesting that they are spreading, and it's really recognizing, you know, that the underlying problem is the same in the South as it is in the North. The problem has been less labeled. It's called a crisis of capitalism, but it's really not that. It's a crisis of socialism, and both the socialist governments in the North or those that favor, you know, heavy government spending and those in the South are being affected with it. Uh, and people who rely on governments and governments who make these promises have to rethink that relationship. You know, it comes back to a one of my favorite quotes from Margaret Thatcher a few years ago. She said that gov the problem with socialism is that eventually governments run out of other people's money. And that's exactly what's happening in Europe. That actually happened long ago, but not only did they run out of money, but they're now running out of borrowing capacity. They tried to keep the game going by borrowing mo more and more money. But they've reached a stage where they can't borrow anymore. So what governments in Europe have to have to rethink, and this is true in the North as well as it is in the South, some of the socialist policies that they followed in the past, because literally they've run out of money, they've run out of borrowing capacity, and that's the core issue that's uh, behind the crisis. Let's talk a little bit more about what impact this could have on the euro, because it's interesting, this Dutch Freedom Party commissioned a report that we actually covered back in March that Lombard Research did called Netherlands in the Euro, and it showed why the Netherlands would benefit by leaving the euro, saying that Italy, Greece, in Spain, Portugal would need a lot more money, and Germany and the Netherlands would end up footing the bill. And the party's leader of the Dutch Freedom Party is a Eurosceptic, to say the least. What impact would it have if a country like the Netherlands exited the euro? Yeah, I think what it's doing is it's highlighting the problems of the euro itself and the way it's been managed. You know, there's nothing wrong conceptually or in theory with a single currency. After all, the United States has a single currency. You know, the people in California use the same uh, currency that the people in New York do and, you know, throughout the 50 states. But what's happened in Europe is that people in Germany are being forced to bail out people in as Greece and, you know, could probably bail out governments and banks in Greece. And it's taken a single currency beyond just the neutral currency that it's supposed to be, and it's turned into a political currency. Whenever you mix politics and money, you end up having a lot of problems. One of the reasons why the Bundesbank was so successful from 1950 until 2000 managing the Deutschmark is they very clearly guarded their independence. They didn't finance government deficits. They maintained the purchasing power and the stability of the euro. But the ECB has gone another way, and it's not not too surprising to see some of the problems that we're seeing in the euro, rising inflation and some of these um, issues that are 
tearing countries apart rather than bringing to them together, which is what the hope was for the euro initially. Well, yeah, and speaking of the ECB, we see Italian and Spanish yields on the rise again. We've seen the ECB step in in the past, buy bonds in the secondary market through programs like the S&P. Recently, we've heard a European central banker come out and remind everybody, hey, this is still a tool in our tool chest. Do you think that the political will will continue for the foreseeable future for these kind of policies to try to put a ceiling on yields? Yeah, you know, but they may try to do this. They may try to buy more paper in the ECB to keep yields from rising. But the ECB cannot uh, keep all yields down forever. It's just a, a practical impossibility. And just taking the risk away from, you know, a commercial bank and putting it on EC, ECB's bank's balance sheet doesn't really solve any problems. The underlying problem, as I mentioned earlier, is governments have run out of money. They've run out of borrowing capacity. They cannot take on any more debt. Yet they continue to try to do that. The experience has always shown in monetary history that when governments try to take on too much debt and force that debt into the central bank, the currency ultimately gets destroyed. So I wouldn't be too surprised if the euro does break up and Germany will stick to German discipline and go its own way while the rest of Europe might go back to national currencies. How it plays out, no one knows, but it's clear that the present system as it's structured, is, is, its shelf life is limited. It's not going to last much longer. Well, then let's talk about what all of this means and, and what the effect is of it on precious metals. A lot of the scenarios you just mentioned, uh, a euro collapse or a eurozone uh, collapse, uh, as well as the policies that central banks are continuing to try to pursue, along with the reality of these indebted countries. Yeah, well, individuals should take a cue from some of the central banks outside of Europe and what they're doing. You know, central banks are accumulating gold, and they're accumulating gold because it's a safe haven. It's a tangible asset that doesn't have counterparty risk, meaning that it's not dependent on any government or any bank's promise. It's dependent on the fact that the market gives it value because gold has been money for 5,000 years and is likely to remain money for the foreseeable future. So one of the points that I've been making for years is that every individual has to act like their own central bank. And the that, what that means is that you have to have your own gold uh, or silver uh, reserves, you know, own physical metal. Um, and you, when you own that physical metal, you know you're protected from all of the monetary chaos that we've already seen and the monetary chaos that's yet to come. Your wealth, your purchasing power will be preserved uh, by um, owning these physical metals. And the key is, is don't look at the price of the metals. Look at whether they're undervalued, and they still are undervalued. Um, so despite the volatility and fluct price fluctuations you might see, the fact is that they're still undervalued is the important point that you should be focusing on and why you should continue accumulating precious metals. That's interesting. And since you mentioned the central banks, I thought it was very fascinating that IMF data just out shows that Mexico added close to 17 tons of gold to its reserves in March. Turkey, Russia, Kazakhstan all increased their holdings of gold. This is a continuation of a trend you spoke to, which is central banks stocking up on gold. What do you think they're bracing for? And since you mentioned the euro, are they bracing for a euro collapse? Well, what would you rather own, a euro <laughs> or a dollar, or would you rather own gold? I, I think the central banks are voting for gold, and it's probably the logical response. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and along the lines of the central banks, uh, Mr. Turk, one thing that we've talked about in the past is allegations of manipulation of the gold market. And one argument that people make is that central yes. banks are involved in manipulation of the gold market. So how do you reconcile the fact that they're stocking up on gold while at the same time there are arguments that they're manipulating it? I mean, are they manipulating it to push the price down to buy on the dips? Well, there are hundreds of central banks around the world, and you know there's some that are accumulating, and there's some that in the past had been disorting in order to keep the price of gold low. The reason why central banks like the U.S. Treasury uh, or perhaps the, uh, some of the European central banks have an incentive is they want to keep national currencies uh, looking good, even though they're being badly managed and have policies that are destroying the purchasing power of those currencies. You know, gold is a messenger. When the gold price rises, people start to understand that something's happening with their, with their local currency, and as a consequence, they move to gold. You know, the incentive of the Treasury is to keep people in the U.S. dollars, because if you keep people believing that the dollar has value, that gives power to the, to the U.S. Treasury and maintains the, the present system as it's been structured since the end of the Second World War. So do you think that there will be a day, ultimately, when the price of gold will explode upwards because there won't be left, uh, there won't be anyone left to buy on the margin? 
Yeah, there will. But maybe the better way of describing it is not that the price of gold is going to dis explode upward, but the purchasing power of the dollar collapses, mm. you know, which is the title of my book going back to 2004, The Collapse of the Dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that I wrote and my co-author John Rubino wrote about back then is still very much true today. It's just taking much longer for it all to happen simply because governments and central banks have been kicking the can down the road, as the saying goes. But I like to say that that can is no longer a can. It's a two-ton boulder, and it's not going to be kicked much further. Interesting. And I know you're not, you don't have a crystal ball. You can't predict when this will happen or what the chain of events will be. But you are still a believer that there will be a collapse of the dollar and that that will be nearer rather than later term. And I guess I want to know what kind of a scenario it would be that we'd see that. Well, it's really hard to predict. I mean, you can go to a place like Zimbabwe and see what a collapse of that currency did to that economy. But when you're talking about the world... And we will have more with James Turk after the break. And also still ahead, last week we saw President Obama pledge to ramp up speculation of oil futures. We'll give you our three cents on what the onion market has to say about that. But first, your closing market numbers. picture of me when I was like nine years old on to tell the truth. I have a confession. I am a total ghetto princess. I love rap and hip hop music and Christian music. I thought he was kind of a dick yesterday. I'm very proud of the role that Al Jazeera has played. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. drives the world. The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. All right, welcome back. Before the break, our, was ex our guest was explaining why he believes that the collapse of the U.S. dollar is still coming, despite the fact that central banks have kicked the can down the road, which he now calls a boulder. He explained further why. Let's listen to what James Turk, founder of Gold Money and author of The Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It, said about that of that currency did to that economy. But when you're talking about the world's reserve currency collapsing, we've never been here before. So there's no precedent to say this is going to happen or that's going to happen. But if you stop and think that the euro is mainly backed by the U.S. dollar, if the U.S. dollar goes into the black hole, will the gravitational pull pull the euro and the other fiat currencies that are using dollars as reserves, like uh, the Japanese yen, will they go into the black hole along with the U.S. dollar? I think that's what the possibility is. And central banks are obviously worried about that, and that's why they're taking this, these steps that they're taking, you know, the long-term refinancing operation from the ECB, the huge swap lines that the, that the um, Federal Reserve is extending to Europe. Mm -hmm. But these things are not solving the underlying problem. There's too much debt. That debt has to be repaid or written off by the banks, and the central banks are afraid if all of the bad debts are written off, most of the banking system worldwide would be insolvent. But it's an inevitability that these debts have to disappear one way or the other, and unfortunately, central banks today are not addressing the heart of the problem.
Are you saying they're uh, protecting the banks at the expense possible of the currencies and faith in the currencies? Yeah, they're protecting their banks and they're protecting the way the system presently works. You know, there's a relationship between the governments and the banks. All of this new financing that the Spanish government did, or a large portion of it, was bought by the Spanish banks. That gave the, the Spanish government the currency it needed to continue fulfilling its promises. But the point I was making at the very beginning of this interview, we're, at, we're pretty close to the end of the line here. Mm -hmm. And my time frame has always been 2013 to 2015 when things are going to blow up. And we are, I think, moving toward that kind of time frame that eventually central banks are going to have to realize that the policies that they're pursuing are no longer sustainable. Governments are going to have to recognize that they cannot count on uh, commercial banks to buy government paper to give them the currency that they want to spend, and that we're going to need uh, Bundesbank-style discipline mm -hmm. on the euro, and not just the euro, but all of the world's fiat currencies. In the absence of that Bundesbank fiscal discipline that made the Bundesbank, a, uh, the Deutschmark, a great currency for 50 years, mm -hmm. it's inevitable that fiat currencies are going to... Um, collapse, go over the end of the cliff, or however you want to describe it. Right. Policymakers still appear to be trying. If you watch the IMF, they're just thinking, oh, hey, if we keep trying to paper it over with a large enough bailout fund, maybe this will go away, but it certainly isn't. Meanwhile, I want to talk about the issue of counterparty risk, because here in Washington today, Mr. Turk, there's yes. a hearing going on about how to prevent an MF global type collapse from happening again, a firm that collapses, taking customer money with it. Now, uh, gold is something that a lot of people own through ETFs, futures and other derivatives which have counterparty risk. Do you think people should be liquidating these right. positions and going into physical gold? Yeah, I really do. But let's look at it from a big picture point of view. When you're talking about wealth, wealth comes in two different forms. It comes in tangible assets, mm -hmm. be it gold, silver, houses, farmland, timberland, and it comes in financial assets, you know, bank accounts, insurance accounts, and that type of thing. Financial assets have counterparty risk associated with them. The value of that asset is dependent on someone's promise, whereas a tangible asset, the value is in the asset itself. And when you're in a financial bust, people are concerned about the promises that have been broken and are likely to be broken as the financial bust continues. So it's very natural to see people moving out of financial assets into tangible assets, and you're starting to see that. You're even seeing people move out of questionable finance, financial assets into what they think are safer financial assets. So there's been a huge flow of euros from Southern Europe into uh, Northern Europe, thinking that the Northern European banks are better than the Southern European banks. But eventually, when this financial crisis comes to its final conclusion, there'll be, a, uh, I think, a tidal wave of people moving out of financial assets into tangible assets of all sorts, because you're better off owning a commercial building in uh, London or Paris or Ber Berlin than you are having you know, a huge amount of money sitting in a bank, regardless where that bank happens to be in the world today, because there's so many bad assets in the banking system. Yeah, that's a really interesting analysis. One slightly more specific issue, because I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to get a little more specifically into gold with you. Miners have underperformed uh, the market for physical gold recently. One reason that I've seen given is that tax policies in the countries within which they are domiciled have affected them. Why do you think uh, the reason is that miners have underperformed the physical market? Yeah, it's not just recently. If you really look at it, you know, gold's been in a bull market for 12 years, and miners have been in a bear market, really, the way I measure the price of mining stocks in terms of gold, not in terms of dollars or euros. They've been in a bear market for 15 years, uh, going back to the collapse of Briex. You know, share prices are a function of two things. They're a function of price and they're a function of earnings. And both of those things are absolute numbers that we can look at, but sentiment really determines the ratio, the price-earning ratio. And for the past 15 years, the sentiment toward the mining shares has just continually been negative. It started with the collapse of Briex. It started with some, it continued with some of the disastrous hedging programs in the banking system. Um, people then saw the ETFs as an easier way to have exposure to the gold sector than taking the risk of owning a, a mining stock. And Basically, that's continued to this day. But we're at a historic moment in time that the mining shares have never been this undervalued. And I'm basically a value investor. So I look at the situation and say to myself, well, I should just continue accumulating value because that's where basically the value is. But the interesting thing is not only are the mining shares undervalued, but gold is undervalued too, as is silver. So I think the whole sector is a place where people should be you know, putting more and more of their assets. Mm -hmm. You know, view gold to be a form of savings. And when you're accumulating gold, you're saving sound money, and I think that's a good thing.
James Turk, founder of Gold Money and author of the book The Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from It, I asked what he thinks is behind the stock market move. Well, you know, the stock market has been going up not because of a good economy, uh, because uh, employment is still relatively low. Uh, the stock market has been going up because of money printing. And what's happened over the past couple of months is that the Fed announced QE3 in September, but they actually haven't been purchasing any government bonds. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve today is the same size as it was two months ago. So the Federal Reserve has to put some juice into the system if it wants to get the stock market rising. That's a really interesting and good point. Now, let's talk about what has returned the most during the last Obama term. There is this great chart. I'm going to put it up for our viewers, and it shows all of these different assets and, and what they've returned. And gold and silver lead the way. Now, we're told by neoclassical economists and policymakers that the Fed needs to print and we need to spend to get on a good growth track and rebuild a healthy economy. But what does it mean that a non dividend yielding asset, two of them actually, have performed the best out of all these financial assets. Yeah, you know, it's not really a return on gold. It's just the appreciation of gold, or to be more precise, the depreciation, depreciation of the purchasing power of the dollar. You know, gold buys the same amount of crude oil it did four years ago. Same thing with silver. What's happened is the dollar purchased a lot less because of all of this money printing. You know, what the Federal Reserve has been trying to do is to jumpstart the economy by printing all of this new money. Quantitative easing is what they call it. Uh, but it really hasn't had any impact. You know, QE1 didn't have much impact. QE2 didn't have much impact. And it's unlikely that QE3 will either. All it will do is continue to depreciate the purchasing power of the dollar. And as a consequence, the price of gold and the price of silver will go up as the dollar loses purchasing power. Yeah, so as you say, you believe QE hasn't had any impact, but what we have seen that has had an impact arguably is the government spending that's been going on the last four years, trillion dollar plus budget deficits in the U.S., government debt getting racked up to $16 trillion, no real plan to rein it in, and essentially Americans voted for four more years of that, uh, I would logically argue, because they voted for Obama again. Can the U.S. sustain this for four more years without some kind of debt crisis, in your view? I don't think so. Um, you know, I've always felt that regardless of who is in the White House, that between 20 and 13 and, uh, 2013 and 2015, uh, everything would come together. Uh, it's simply a mathematical equation of looking at the government's cash flow, in other words, how much revenue it's receiving based on economic activity, and how much money it's spending and likely to spend you know, over this period of time. And I think we're going to hit the crunch still within a 2013 to 2015 time frame. Okay, wow. So there's a prediction there that you're sticking to. And now, of course, short term, everyone in the U.S. is talking about the fiscal cliff. The elections were yesterday. Today, Alan Greenspan, former Fed chairman on TV, talking about how we need a roadmap to avoid the fiscal cliff. And we can't do this last minute uh, business as they do on Capitol Hill. And he's worried that's going to continue because still we have a Congress and a White House that are divided. My question is with so many people pushing for some kind of a solution to the deficits, to the debt in the United States. And with Washington unable to come to any compromise, isn't the fiscal cliff at least something that achieves some kind of action in terms of helping the deficit situation? And does the fact that people are so freaked out about it and really urging against it show that there's really no tolerance for economic pain at all to deal with the deficit? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I think we can expect over the next couple of months is another uh, downgrade in the U.S. Uh, credit rating, um, simply because of the size of the deficits and the inability or unwillingness uh, of Washington to come to grips with that and to put the country onto a path uh, going back toward in the right direction and in improving the country's solvency. But, you know, the present situation is unsustainable and, um, you know, uh, it, it is going to, um, I think, result in some kind of a, a blow up in the not too distant future. But the important thing, I think, Lauren, is that the, there's a more important concept than the fiscal cliff. It's really a currency cliff. Um, what's going to happen is the dollar is going to continue to lose purchasing power uh, because of inflation and probably also declining against other currencies as well. But at least uh, inflation will be picking up, purchasing power will be declining, and you know the, the dollar is going to go over the cliff. And that's more worrying uh, because once the dollar goes over the cliff, then it's likely that the economy could be irreparably damaged. 
Oh, wow. And, and the currency cliff is something I want to get to more when we look at what you found in, in your recent paper about gold. But first, before we get into that, kind of to, to get into that nicely, oil today, uh, which is for sure a bellwether of where people think growth is going to be, I, I would guess, because it's a major input. So it fell the most, according to Bloomberg, since November of 2011. Why do you think it's falling? It's the same reason the stock market is falling. You know, the Federal Reserve hasn't been injecting any money into the system. Um, and, you know, there was an expression that came out decades ago by a newsletter writer by the name of Richard Russell. He said, inflate or die. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's basically the system that, as it exists today. The Federal Reserve has to keep inflating or the system is going to collapse. And because the Federal Reserve hasn't expanded its balance sheet over the, couple, the last couple of months, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about doing it, but the market wants to see some action. And uh, as a consequence, you're seeing a sell-off pretty much across the board in most markets. Really interesting. And, and speaking of central bank inflating, when you look at oil prices, uh, they look very different depending on which currency you're looking at. I want to bring up a chart, and this is from uh, Gold Money. This is, this is your chart, and it shows the uh, crude oil prices from the 70s to June of 2012 in pounds, in dollars, in euros, and gold grams. And what's incredible is that the purchasing power of gold, uh, in terms of oil, it's been able to buy the same amount for decades, unlike all of these other national currencies. Why is that? Um, it's basically because, you know, gold is money. Um, it's not um, consumed like other assets. It's accumulated. And this above ground stock of gold grows by approximately the same amount as world population and new wealth creation. So over long periods of time, gold has consistency and purchasing power. Uh, that's why I was saying earlier, it's not that the price of gold is going up. It's that the purchasing power of the dollar is, is going down. You know, an ounce of gold buys the same amount of crude oil it did 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, that shows that it's not a good investment because it hasn't increased your wealth, but it shows that it's very good money because it does one of the important things that money is supposed to do, which is to preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. Right, unlike all of these other national currencies. And when we're talking about the gold stock, you actually found in your research that the stock of gold uh, you found is less than is widely reported. You put it a little over 15,000 tons versus the just more than 171,000 tons that is widely reported. This is a difference of about 16,000 tons or $877 billion in nominal terms. So what is this uh, research based on and why does this matter? Well, it, it does matter because, you know, there's a difference between physical gold and paper gold. And there's a lot of paper gold out there. Uh, but, you know, paper gold isn't really gold. It's just exposure to the gold price. And that exposure to the gold price comes with counterparty risk. In other words, it's a financial asset, whereas physical gold is a tangible asset. And as you work through a financial crisis, and, you know, we've been in one for a few years and it's going to continue for a few more years, people ultimately move out of financial assets into tangibles. And the same thing is going to happen in gold. Uh, the fact that there's less physical gold here ultimately means that uh, the panic or the scramble into, out of paper gold and into physical gold is probably going to be even more dramatic than, than people expect, simply because there's a lot less physical gold than people have been led to believe over the past uh, several years. Interesting. What does that mean for the price, do you think? Well, you know, in the longer term, it ultimately means the price is probably going to go even higher than what I've been expecting. Uh, you know, if you have less supply of something than what people think, uh, ultimately it's reflected in the price and the price is going to go higher. And remind but the us price is going to go higher anyway, Lauren, simply because of the dollar debasement and the other um, factors that are going on um, around the world. And, and remind us what your projection is of gold, just for anybody that, that can't remember off the top of their head. Well, I've been sticking to this uh, forecast that I made back in 2003 when gold was $350 an ounce. I was saying that between 2013 and 2015, it was going to be $8,000 an ounce and the Dow would be 8000 So you'd have a one-to-one -one relationship between gold and the Dow, just like you did at the end of the last bust, which was 1980, when gold was one-to-one, -one, uh, 800 on gold and 800 on Dow. And just like you did back in the 1930s at the end of that bust, when you had gold at 35 and the Dow at 35. So, you know, this one-to-one -one relationship continues to reappear, and I think that's ultimately where we're headed. But, you know, if the Fed continues on this monet uh, monetary uh, quantitative easing path, uh, ultimately, I think the gold price could go much higher. Wow. And I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. This hearing is adjourned.